Hey guys, I hope this video finds you well, but I decided I wanted to read to you guys some books that I think you would really enjoy. You can take AR tests on these, so I encourage you to take notes. I'm only going to be posting videos of like a chapter or two at a time, but uh, right now I'm going to be starting with uh, Woods Runner by Gary Pawson. We all know who Gary Pawson is. He wrote Hatchet. So I think you'll really enjoy it. I'm going to start with the back so you get a good idea of what's going to happen throughout uh, this book. So 13-year-old Samuel lives with his parents on the edge of the wilderness in the British colony of Pennsylvania, a long way from the civilization of any town. Samuel knows how to hunt and how to survive in the untamed forest that surrounds his home on the frontier, where it can take days for news to arrive. There are rumors that the American patriots have begun a bloody war against the English. To Samuel, the fighting in the cities and towns to the east seem far away. Then the war comes to him. In a savage attack by British soldiers in Iroquois, Samuel's parents are taken prisoner. Samuel follows their trail, drawing on his forest skills, skills determined to find and uh, a way to rescue them. Each day he confronts the enemy in the unbelievable cruelty, tragedy, and horror of the war. But he also discovers unexpected allies, men and women, working secretly on behalf of the Patriots. And he learns that he must plunge deep into enemy territory to find his parents. He must follow them all the way to the British headquarters in New York City. Gary Paulson brings readers into the flesh and blood reality of one boy's struggle in the long and savage war that was the American Revolution, a war that changed people's lives in infinite ways and whose outcome continues to reverberate throughout America today. So this happens during the American Revolution, which is, uh, it spans through many years, but uh, this book, starts in 1776 which is when the Declaration of Independence is signed uh, but I'm assuming this starts right before that and because news does travel very slowly like they mentioned um, even after it's signed the war continues for a couple years because people didn't realize it was supposed to end so I'm excited to see how this ends, how this gets started. Okay, also I know that um, in George versus George, we didn't quite get to the Revolutionary War. We we know why it started, uh, so I think this would be good for us to like figure out like maybe how it all went and how it all played out. Um, so let's get started. Part one is divided into three parts. Part 1, Green, The Forest, 1776. Chapter 1. He was not sure exactly when he became a child of the forest. One day it seemed he was 11 and playing in the dirt around the cabin or helping with chores. And the next day he was 13, carrying a 40 caliber Pennsylvania flintlock rifle, wearing smoked buckskin clothing and moccasins moving through the forest like a knife through water while he tracked deer to bring home to the cabin for meat. He sat now by a game trail, waiting for the deer he knew would come soon. He had heard it, a branch brushing a hairy side, a twig crackling, smelled it when the wind blew towards him, the musk and urine of a buck. He checked the priming on his rifle while he waited, his mind and body relaxed, patient, ears and eyes and nose alert, quiet, every part of him at rest, yet focused and intense. And he pictured his life, how he lived in two worlds. Sometimes Samuel, Samuel thought that a line dividing those worlds went right through their cabin. To the west, beyond the small parchment window made of grease-soaked sheepskin, scraped paper thin, lay the forest. The forest was unimaginably vast, impenetrable, mysterious, and dark. His father had told him that a man could walk west for a month, walk as fast as he could, and never see the sun, so high and dense was the canopy of leaves. 
even close to their homestead, twelve acres clawed out of the timber with a small log cabin and a lean-in for a barn. The forest was so thick that in the summer Samuel could not see more than ten or fifteen yards into it. Some oak and elm and maple trees were four and five feet in diameter, so tall and thick and foliaged their height could only be guessed. A wild world. And while there were trails made by game and sometimes used by natives, settlers, or trappers, the paths wandered and meandered so that they were impossible to use in any sensible way except to hunt. When he first started going into the forest, Samuel went only a short distance. That first time, though he was well armed with his light Pennsylvania rifle and dry powder and a good knife, he instantly felt like he was in an alien world. As a human, he did not belong. It was a world that did not care about man any more than it cared about dirt or grass or leaves. He did not get lost that first time because he'd marked trees with his knife as he walked so he could find his way out. But still, in some way, he felt lost. As if, were he not careful, a part of him would disappear and never return, gone to the wilderness. Samuel had heard stories of that happening to some men. They entered the forest to hunt or trap or look for new land to settle and simply vanished. Gone to the woods, people said of them. Some he knew were dead, killed by accident or panthers or bears or Indians. He had seen such bodies. One, a man mauled to death by a bear that had attacked his horse while the man was plowing. The man's head was eaten. Another, killed by an arrow through the throat. An arrow Samuel knew that came out of the woods from a bow that was never seen, shot by a man who was never known. And when he was small and safe in his cabin, near the mud-brick fireplace with his mother and father, he had heard the panthers scream. They sounded like a woman gone mad. Oh, he knew the forest could kill. Once sitting by the fire, a distant relative, a shirt-tail uncle who was very old, a man of nearly fifty named Ishmael, had looked over his shoulder as if expecting to see monsters and said, Nothing dies of old age in the forest. Not bugs, not deers, not bear, nor panthers, nor man. Live long enough, be slow enough, get old enough, and something eats you. Everything kills. And yet, Samuel loved the forest now. He knew the sounds and smells and images like he knew his own mind, his own yard, each time he had entered, he'd gone further, learned more, marked more trees with his knife until he always knew where he was. Now he thought of the deep forest as his home, as much as his cabin. But some men vanished for other reasons, too. Because the forest pulled them, and the wild would not let them go. Three years ago, when Samuel was ten, he had seen one of these men. A man who moved like smoke, his rifle a part of his arm, a tomahawk through his belt next to a slab blade knife, eyes that saw all things, ears that heard all things. One family in the settlement had a room in their cabin that was kind of a store. The man had come to the store to buy small bits of cloth and powder and English flints for his rifle. At the same time, Samuel was waiting with his mother to buy thread. The man smelled of deep forest, of smoke and blood and grease and something green. Samuel knew that he had smelled that way too. The stranger could not be still. As he stood waiting, he moved. Though he was courteous and nodded to people, as soon as he had his supplies for his rifle and some salt, he left. He was there one moment and gone the next into the trees, gliding on soft moccasins to become part of the forest as much as any tree or leaf or animal. He went west. 
away from man, away from buildings and settled land. Now Samuel heard a new sound. He moved his eyes slowly to the left without turning his head, and he was rewarded by seeing a tick-infested rabbit sitting by a tree, trying to clear the insects out of his ears. Samuel smiled. Even in the dead of winter, the rabbits were always trying to rid themselves of the pests. The sight made him think of his mother, who was intensely curious and had once asked him to take her into the forest. They had not gone far, not over 500 yards from the edge of the clearing, and had stopped under a towering oak where sunlight could not even get through. There was a subdued green light over everything. Even their faces looked a gentle green. I have to go back, she said, her eyes wide, wrapping a shawl tightly around her shoulders, though it was summer warm. This is too, too thick. Even the air is green, so thick it feels like it could be cut. I have to go back now. Although Samuel's parents lived in the wilderness, they were not a part of it. They had been raised in towns and had been educated in schools where they'd been taught to read and write and play musical instruments. They moved west when Samuel was a baby so they could devote themselves to a quiet life of hard physical work and contemplation. They loved the woods, but they did not understand them, not like Samuel. They had told their son that they didn't belong in towns either. They weren't comfortable in the world of roads, houses, and villages. East of the imaginary line in the cabin was what his father and mother called civilization. So civilization to the east and to the west are the woods. They told Samuel about the chaos of towns that they'd escaped. There were noises, hammers clanking at the blacksmith forges, Chickens clucking, dogs barking, cows lowing, horses whining and wickering, people who always seemed to need to talk to someone. There wasn't noise in the forest. There were smells. Wood smoke filled the air in every season because it wasn't just for heat, but to cook as well. The smell of oak for long fires, pine for short and fast and hot fires. The smell of bread and sometimes, if they were lucky and had honey or rock sugar to pulverize in a sack with a hammer, sweet pie. The odor of stew cooking in the cast iron pot over an outside fire or in an iron kettle hung in the fireplace. The scent flying up through the chimney and out and over the grounds as the wind moved the smoke around. There was the tang of manure stacked in the back of a small shed-like barn to age before it was put on the gardens, horse and cow and chicken manure from their farm and other farms. So many smells swirled by the same wind throughout the small valley. Their valley was like a huge bull nestled in the hills in far western Pennsylvania. Here lived and had always lived Samuel Lee Smith age 13, with his father Olin and his mother Abigail, parents whom Samuel did not always understand, but whom he loved. They read books to him about the world beyond their prized books. Oh, they read to him about the world beyond from their prized books, all the long winter nights with tallow candles burning while they sat by the fireplace, they read aloud to each other. At first he listened as, he, as they took turns, and later he read to himself and knew the joyous romp of words on paper. He read all the books that they had in the cabin and then books from other cabins in the valley so that he could know more and more about the world found only in his imagination and dreams. To the east lay the faraway world of enormous cities and the great sea and Europe and ancient Rome and the darkest Africa and the mysterious land of the Asias and so many people they couldn't be counted. All kinds of different people with foreign languages and their knowledge of strange worlds. To the east lay polished shoes and ornate clothes and formal manners and enormous wealth. 
His mother could spin tales for him about cultured men who wore carefully powdered wigs and dipped snuff out of little silver snuff boxes, and beautiful women dressed in gowns of silk and satin with swirling petticoats as they danced in the great houses and exclusive salons of London and Paris. Now, the deer stepped out. It stood in complete profile not thirty yards away. Samuel held his breath. He waited for it to turn away, look around in caution. When it did, he raised the rifle and cocked the hammer, pulling it back as quietly as he could, the sear dropping in with a soft snick. The rifle had two triggers, a set trigger that armed the second, the front trigger, and made it so sensitive that a mere brush released the hammer. He moved his finger from the set trigger and laid it next to but didn't touch the hair trigger. Then he settled the German silver blade off the front of the sight into the tiny notch on the rear sight and floated the tip of the blade sight until it rested just below the shoulder of the young buck. So he's aiming directly over its heart. A half a second, no, a quarter of a second passed. Samuel could touch the hair trigger now and the hammer would drop. The flint would scrape the metal frizzen, kicking it out of the way and showering sparks down on the powder in the small pan, which would ignite and blow a hot jet of gas into the touch hole on the side of the barrel of the rifle, setting off the charge, propelling the small forty caliber ball down the bore. Because uh, before the book... Before the buck heard the sound of the rifle, the ball would pass through the heart of the uh, deer and out the other side of it, killing it. So that's how a gun works. And yet he did not pull the trigger. He waited part of a second, then a full second, and another. The deer turned, saw him standing there. With a convulsive explosion of muscles, it jumped straight into the air. It landed running and disappeared into the trees. The whole time, Samuel had not really been thinking of the deer, but what lay east of what they called civilization. He eased the hammer of the rifle down to the first notch on the sear, a safety position, and lowered the weapon. Oddly, he wasn't disappointed he'd not taken the shot. Though the fresh meat would have been nice roasted over the hearth, he killed plenty of deer, sometimes 10 or 15 a day, so many they could not possibly eat all the meat. He often shot them because the deer raided the cornfield that had, um, and they had to be killed to save the crop. Most families did not like deer meat anyway. They considered it stringy and tough, and it was often wormy. The preferred meat was bear or beaver, which were richer and less cordy. This deer would have been nice. They had not had fresh meat in nearly two weeks, but it, it was gone now. He could not stop wondering about what lay to the east the world it was supposed to be a better place than the frontier it was more uh sensible it was a more sensible way to live and yet he had just learned an ugly truth about that world only just the evening before those people in the world who were supposed to be civilized full of knowledge and wisdom and graciousness and wealth and education were caught in the madness of a vicious bloody war it did not make sense. Samuel started trotting back into, uh, toward the cabin in an easy shuffle walk that moved him quietly uh, and at some speed without wearing out his moccasins. He was lucky to get a month per pair before they had worn through the heels. He moved without a great deal of effort, his eyes and ears missing um, every, very little as he almost flowed through the forest but his mind was still on the man who had brought the sheet of paper the night before that concludes chapter one I wonder what was on the sheet of paper now here is a snippet of information that 
uh, Gary Pawson has included at the end of every chapter, just a quick history debrief, and this one is on communication. In the year 1776, the fastest form of travel for any distance over 30 or 40 miles was by ship. With steady wind, a sailing vessel could clock one to two hundred miles a day for weeks on end. A horse could cover thirty, maybe even forty miles a day, although not for an extended period without breaking down. At best, coaches could do a hundred miles um, in twenty-four hours a day by changing horses every ten or fifteen miles, but only if the roads were in good shape which they almost never were. A man could walk 20 or 30 miles a day faster for short periods, but always depending on the conditions of the land, weather, and foot gear. 15 miles a day was standard. So there was no fast and dependable way to transmit information in those years. No telegraph, no telephone, no internet, no texting, and no overnight delivery services. It might take five or six days for knowledge of an important event to move just 10 miles carried by a traveler on foot. Settlements were 12 to 15 miles apart and information was carried by hand from person to person on paper or in most cases shared by word of mouth. So you can just imagine the man who brought the paper the day before with this information about how communication worked back then, the information on that piece of paper is old news. I'm curious how old that news is. So that concludes chapter one. Um, I'll post chapter two tomorrow. Thank you for listening. And take notes. I uh, am including a PDF of a sheet that you can print out, which is just like um, pretty simple. You just write the title of the book and then what chapter you just read. Um, and then just like one or two sentences about what was most important. So you can write about who Samuel is. He's a hunter in the woods. Uh, he lives, like, he, he has uh, these instincts that uh, help him track deer. And he also lives in a cabin with two worlds. Like, th there's a world where he can go to the west and hunt, and then there's this world that his parents grew up in that his parents have told him about, and he's investigated through books of civilization and cities. Um, so I would definitely write a quick snippet about that, how there are, like, there are two worlds, and he's only a part of the one in the West. He mentioned that everything in the East is just only what he can imagine, so that's pretty interesting, too. But thank you for listening. Bye, guys.